Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are continuing our study in the book of Romans. We are in Romans chapter 12. Wanted to go back to the top, look at the first couple verses there. Uh, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We're talking about worship because it's all worship. This is what we're doing right now. This is why you dress the way you dress. This is why you act and the fact that you sing or stand or sit or kneel or pray or give or listen with receptive hearts. It's all worship. And today is a very special worship experience at our church because not only do we get to participate in communion today in the breaking of bread, but we also get to have a family uh, meeting where afterwards we're going to look ahead to our year and just see all the wonderful things that we want to accomplish in 2024. And so in going through our study in the book of Romans, I really wanted to save verses 1 and 2 from Romans 12 for today because I thought it would go perfect for our time together. Our English word for worship comes from two words, worth, like as in value, and ship which is still used today in England, right? It's still used in British law for when you see a judge, you would call them your worship, which means that you're paying homage, you're paying respect. And in Hebrew, it literally means to bow down or to show reverence or to lay prostrate. And Paul seems to be saying right here at the beginning of chapter 12, that we are created for this reason. You and I, we are created to worship. But notice in your Bible, right before, Paul has a prerequisite. He says, therefore, by the mercies of God, last week we talked about grace, and we said that Christians should be people who extend grace. Grace has been shown to us, we should show it to others. And Paul starts chapter 12 by saying, because of God's great mercy, we worship. One of my little quirks is I talk to myself. I actually talk to myself a lot, out loud. And admittedly, a lot of the self-talk is negative. And many people do this. It's, it, you know, if it's you as well, you are not alone. A lot of our self-talk typically goes like, I'm not good enough, why did I do that? I'm not smart enough, nobody likes me, I'm not skinny enough, pretty enough, rich enough. And what happens is all of this self-talk weighs us down during the week. And then Sunday morning we walk into church and we don't feel good. So rather than worship God, we sit there like a loser. And I wonder how many people stay away from church because they don't feel worthy. They feel lost. And Paul says, no, it's, it's because of his great mercy that we should be focused on him. Worship is about him. It's not about us or our worthiness. Psalms says, I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. You know, one of the enemy's greatest tactics is to get you focused on the things that are bothering you, the things that are wrong with you. Because once you're fixated on your problems, you will totally forget how great and how good God is. Don't fall for that trick. So Paul wants to make sure you have the right heart for worship. That when we walk through those doors and, and, and he, he, you, you feel that you are now in his house, that you are in his presence, Paul says, in light of all that God has done for you, what? What's our response? Sacrifice. Now, when you hear that word, granted, it kind of makes us cringe, right? Because sacrifice never sounds positive. Sacrifice either sounds like something has to die or something has to be lost or given up. The Greek word offer is the word peristesis. 
It's the same word we use in the Old Testament for the priest who goes to the altar, takes the animal, lays it down, kills it. Why? Why was this done? Well, to pay the price for sin, to, to make atonement, to, to settle the score. And the same word is used here. Paul says, in light of everything God has done for you, offer yourself. But notice that this word is not about death, because he says we are to be a living sacrifice. Isaac is the perfect example of this. His father Abraham brought him out to sacrifice him as the Lord instructed, and Abraham bound him, was ready to kill him, and angel of the Lord stopped uh, what he was doing and provided a lamb. Most scholars suggest that Isaac is not a little boy in this moment. He's rather a grown teenager who could have easily put up a fight if he wasn't willing, but he doesn't. He's willing to go to the altar. Isaac is a living sacrifice. And what is interesting here is earlier in the story, as Abraham and Isaac are traveling to make this sacrifice, they come to their, play, they come to their destination and Abraham turns to his servants and he says, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Because the end of the story is God provides a lamb to take Isaac's place just as God did for us. God provides Jesus, his son, to be our lamb of God. So it, it's not just a sacrifice, is it, that we are called to. No, the Bible says, offer your body. Isaac offered his body. Abraham offered his son. It was the very best that they could give. That means their sacrifice was personal. I can't think of something more costly to give God outside of my own life than to offer up my child. That is the most precious thing. And it really makes me take a hard look at the things that I offer God today. You know, sometimes people leave food and clothes at the church doorstep, presumably to give to the less fortunate. I can remember a while back, somebody gave us expired food. Expired food is not a donation. And it certainly is not a sacrifice. It's actually garbage. Have you ever walked around a garage sale and you thought to yourself, you guys want money for this stuff? None of this is worth anything. Look at Paul's equation again and tell me what you see. Therefore, by the mercies of God, that means because of God's mercy, because of his mercy and everything he's done for you, what do you do? What is the action step? Present your body as a living sacrifice. That's what we do. And what are the conditions of that? Holy and acceptable to God. God doesn't want our scraps. He doesn't want our expired food. Does God want our garage sale items? No. No, Paul gives us a reason to worship and he says, in view of God's mercy, and then he gives us a requirement. And that worship should be holy and pleasing to him. Tell me something. Do you guys uh, know what the meaning of life is? <laughs> What's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? Why are we here? What's the point? What does God want you to do with your life? It's the big question, right? What is holy and acceptable to him? You. God wants you. Listen, God doesn't want your money. God doesn't want your time. God doesn't want your talents. He wants you. And if you give him you, if you give him all of you, all those other things I mentioned, they happen naturally. You know, last week we talked about people who had the gift of service or the gift of giving, and those might have been a struggle for you. But you know, I only, I only preach about money once a year because I know the thought that runs through everybody's head that, oh, here we go again, the pastor wants everybody's money. So if serving or giving is hard for you, and you have some of those thoughts, they run through your head. You know, somebody on the stage asks for help, 
and you're thinking, yeah, man, that's difficult, perhaps it's because you have not yet fully given yourself to God first. Because if you've fully given yourself to God first, then anything else that God asks you for after that is easy. Do you think that Isaac ever forgot that day? You think years later, Abraham and he are sitting around the fire and Abraham has to remind Isaac and say, hey, do you remember that? <laughs> you remember that time that I tied you up and tried to burn you? And Isaac's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. No, both of those men remembered that day forever and remembered what was given to them, what God had done for them. God spared Abraham's son. God gave Isaac his life back. That's what God did. So after that, when God says, hey, can you guys do me a favor? What's the response? Eh, you know, maybe later. I'm busy. No, the response to the one who has shown me mercy and grace is to drop everything and give my best. Remember, Paul is talking about worship. Church, all of this is about worship. And I think one of the biggest problems in the church today is people who are trying to take something and not give something. People will leave a church and they'll say, Ugh, they, I didn't get much out of it. When people are visiting a church, they evaluate the music and the sermon to see if they like it. But the point of coming to worship isn't to get something. It's to give something, to sacrifice something personal. Remember, I told you the priest would put the animal on the altar and kill it. And that was it. The animal was dead. But that's what makes our sacrifice so different. We are still alive. So God wants you you to be a sacrifice, but he wants you to keep on living for Jesus. So today I'm not asking you to be like Isaac. I'm not asking you to die for God. I'm asking you to live for him. Because I think in some ways it might be easier to die for Jesus than to live for him. I believe if somebody pointed a gun to your head and said, you know, renounce your faith or die, you would say, well, go ahead and shoot. And then we'd just go to heaven, right? I think it's harder to go to work and to go to school tomorrow and actually live a Christ-surrendered life. I think that's harder to do. That is why our sacrifice has to be practical. We need to learn how to live our faith every day. On one side of the transaction, you say, God, here I am, I offer my body to you. But the other side of the coin is the very next verse. Don't conform. Verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, Give your body, but don't conform. There's always been the pressure to look like, dress like, act like everybody else. And it starts in school, right? It never stops. When I was in high, sc when I was in high school or, or middle school, I remember one day I came home in tears because I didn't have rags, pants, and Vans shoes. I didn't own an Izod shirt. I didn't have a members only jacket. And the truth was those clothes were not even my style. I didn't want to wear those clothes. I was pressured to. Years later, I was pressured to smoke cigarettes. I was pressured to take drugs, to fit in. Yeah, does anybody know what this is? It's a Stanley Cup. It's all the rage right now. You want to see some video footage of Target? Here's Target. And if you're thinking to yourself, is it just a cup? Yes, it is just a cup. It doesn't do anything. Why? Why is this how we are? I don't know. It could be a blogger or an influencer that has a Stanley Cup and you feel inclined, well, I want to get one for myself and maybe they've posted a fun TikTok video about it. And that fun, positive content is just the kind of thing that thrusts some new item to popularity. There was an assistant professor of marketing 
She works at the Leeds Business School, and she said that we as consumers are often drawn to items that we view positively or would improve our life. And she says, take for instance, the Stanley Tumbler. She says it's not just a water bottle. It also represents a healthy lifestyle. So if you use the Stanley Tum Tumbler, you think to yourself, I now belong to this group of people who are health conscious. Bottom line, it's about fitting in, belonging, conforming. Everyone wants to feel like they belong. And so the world is trying to pressure us to act like everybody else, to look like everybody else, to dress like everybody else, so that we can satisfy that feeling of belonging. Because we are all chasing it. Everybody wants to feel like they belong. And so the world is trying to pressure us to act like everybody else. And there's nothing wrong with belonging. There's nothing wrong with conforming. But Paul explains what not to conform to. Namely, he says, the world. What does the world preach? Just what you saw in that video. Pushing, climbing over other people, taking more than your share. The world says, you do you. Look out for number one. Get some. Get what's yours. Take what's yours. But that's not how Jesus lived. That's the opposite of how we should live. Paul says it's about worship and it's about sacrifice. For the Christian, I don't live for self or pleasure. I live for God. After all, the only reason I have any of these blessings, the only reason I have this life, the only reason I can enjoy all these rewards is because of him. Paul says, off yourself, all of yourself, and that, that action is holy and acceptable to God. What does holy mean? It means do not conform to this world. Holy means set apart. Have you ever been to a really nice steak restaurant? I mean, a nice one, right? Expensive. And they bring you the potatoes and the broccoli on one plate? <laughs> do you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> and they bring you the steak on another plate, all by itself. That steak is holy, right? Because holy means set apart. It's not with the world. We don't act like the world. I heard about a parade one time and there was a marching band participating in the parade and everybody was marching in sequence. They were in step except for one band member who was totally out of step with everybody else. And when you look closer at that guy, the TV cameras could pick up the reason why that he was out of step. You would notice that he was wearing a little pair of earbuds in his ear. That means he was listening to a completely different song. Christians need to march out of step. We need to march to the beat of our own drum. What should Christians look like? They should look different. If the world points a finger at us and says, you guys are weird, you guys are strange, you guys are peculiar, we should say, thank you very much. So did my rabbi. We don't conform. Instead, Paul says we are transformed. Paul says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means we act different than everybody else and we think different than everybody else. Paul says in Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Which, if we were just going to go back for a second and remind ourselves, the subject matter is worship. That means worship is so much more than just my time here isn't it? If worship means that I am presenting my body as a living sacrifice and that I'm turning away from conformity of this world and instead being transformed so that I can act different and think different, then that means worship is a lifestyle. 
Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is my life. Colossians 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. How would I react after reading that verse? How would I react? What's my response? Sing a song? Sure. But there's more than that. Well, I'll tithe every, every week. Sure. But it's more than that. Well, I, I mean, I pray every day, absolutely. But it's more than that. We have to expand our definition of worship to something so much larger than just a single weekly experience. Most people may only think of singing as worship. Others think of praying or fasting or tithing. But the truth is, our worship needs to be so much more than that. Worship is our life. Everything we do should be his worship, which means that sets the goal really high. Right? <laughs> but that's exactly where it should be. Worship is more than singing a song. Worship is more than listening to a preacher on Sunday morning. Worship is more than giving my 10%. Worship is more than just me feeling good. Worship is more than just feeling sorry for my sins. Those are small parts of worship. But, but real worship is more than that. Holy and acceptable worship is when we give our lives. You may sing a song, but to whom are you singing it? God. You may listen to a preacher on Sunday morning, but do you apply what they say to your life? Do you take seriously the challenges that are presented each week? Do you feel sorrow for your sins that you've committed when you worship? And what type of sorrow do you feel? Are you feeling like you should turn from those sins? Will you now live differently? You may give your tithe on a weekly budget. But where is your heart when you give? Is it dealing with the money and the loss? Or are you joyful of the kingdom that is gained? Do, does worship have any more experience than just a feeling? Shouldn't we focus more on how our worship makes God feel? Not how we feel. What if our lives, our, our whole lives, was a constant, never-ending worship song to God? If we gave our lives to the cause of Christ, if we lived for him each day, then, then, then the book of Acts, it, it says that the gospel will reach to the ends of the earth. That's what, that's what we should all want, right? And I can't be satisfied with anything less. I can't be satisfied with worship on Sunday only. I can't be satisfied with worship for one day a week. I can't be satisfied to give God my scraps. I can't be satisfied to only give God a part of me. Because this, this is where I come to give God everything. May you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. May you live each day with a renewed mind, not conforming to the things of this world, but being transformed by his power. That is a lifestyle of worship. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the reminder that it's all about you. It's all about bringing you glory. It's all about worshiping you and loving you. May our worship extend beyond just this hour. May it extend beyond just this day. May our knowledge of you and our love of you transform the way we live. May we be reminded of the mercies and graces that are shown to us each day and may that transform us inside and out. 
to look completely different, to be instantly recognizable as a follower of Christ. We thank you for each blessing and all goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, I want to remind you that you can come and worship here because we have two services every single week. Uh, at 9.30, we have a traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to sing songs out of the hymnal. It's going to be just like the church that you grew up in. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. Just come relaxed. Come however you feel, casual. Uh, we've got a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. Our middle school and high school students meet on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. They're going through the book of Matthew. So if you want to send your child to a Bible study, we have a Bible study for them on the, uh, on the weekend night. And of course, between our services, we've got coffee, we've got donuts. We would love to meet you and we would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.